Please join us in welcoming Group Deputy CEO, Group CFO, and Premium Midscale and Economy Division CEO of Accor, Jean-Jacques Morin, in conversation with Skift Senior Hospitality Editor, Sean O'Neill. Jean-Jacques, thank you for joining us here at the Future of Lodging event in, the Lon in London. We're grateful to have you. Thank you. Delighted to be here. Um, so last year, you were named the best chief financial officer in all of France, for across all industries. So congratulations for that. Thank you. <laughs> I, think, I think people here had one question that they could ask the chief financial officer of a major hotel group right at this moment. It would be, is demand staying strong? So it's been about a month since you've reported, is demand staying strong? Yes, I mean, uh, first off, you, you may wonder why I'm not staying in finance, and you've got the answer. I cannot do much better, so I have to try myself on something else. But candidly, I'm delighted to, uh, to be able to, uh, to move in the battle, because that's really the way I look at uh, moving in operations, which is uh, getting to uh, the case. And in Accor, it's, it's, extremely, uh, it's extremely true that we've got uh, gold in our hands, and we just need to be able to transform it. So that's, that's what we're going to try to do. The, the demand, you know, again, I got two hats. One is the CFO, and the other one is the business guy. As a CFO, I do not believe it. As a business guy, I'm a delighted man. <laughs> I mean, the demand is, is incredibly strong, again, in January and February. I'm not telling you anything you don't know. I mean, there is enough statistics in the industry to be uh, aware of that. But what is amazing is that it, it's strong across the board. I, in our case, last year, we had an amazing year in Middle East and Africa. Middle East and Africa, we had a, you know, Trefpar, which is north of 50% last year. But there were some good explanations for it. There were like two big events. Uh, one was uh, the Qatar Football uh, Cup, and the other one was, um, you know, the Dubai International Convention. Despite that, I am better this year than I was at the same period last year. So uh, I, I, I think the only rational explanation that um, I, we've been going through is that um, that pent-up demand is still being fueled by uh, you know, money that people have been putting aside. I just came back from China, which is uh, one of the places uh, that uh, you know, I'm so glad that I can visit again. And so as soon as it opened, and Gary, our, our CEO for uh, China, is here, Gary Rosen. Um, and uh, when I went there, I was amazed, because from all the forecasts we could do, we are way off. I am way off what I think China can do. And when China does it, then the rest of Asia will do it. There was a number quoted by uh, the management team then, which was that there is a statistic that says that the GDP of the UK uh, is the equivalent of the money saved by the Chinese during the last two, three years. Ooh. So there is quite a lot of money to be spent. And I think you're going to find out the same phenomenon as, um, as uh, what we've seen first for the US, but then uh, for, uh, for Europe. So, Again, if I look at what I have in my hands, it just portrays what I said. If I look at what's going on the, uh, around in the world, I'm, I'm quite glad to be uh, in London today and not to be in Paris. <laughs> we understand. Um, I, so you mentioned like you have your two hats. You, from the one hat, it's hard to believe it, and the other hat, it's not. So, I, And what I'm hearing from you is as China comes back with international outbound tourism, that will give another pent-up yeah. savings demand that will continue to give you momentum. Yeah. Do you believe, though, that in the past five years that Accor has gotten better at pricing power and it's gotten better at being able to uh, uh, extract demand from the market or consumer behavior has sort of changed or moving away from uh, material goods experiences in some way that you're at a new higher level for long term? I, I think it's... Uh I, I would love to be able to tell you that it is because of my action that you see it, uh, but I, I think it would, be, it would be unfair. I think uh, as, a, as a company, we've got uh, much better at uh, revenue management. We've got uh, you know, more advanced. Uh, I was just hearing about AI, AI kind of uh, driven uh, pricing tools, so that helps, in fact, certainly being better at uh, decision making. But uh, the reality of it is uh, the fact that uh, you know, this experiential transformation of the business that has been talked of uh, for many, many years is, has now become real. And I think uh, the COVID, from all the bad things that it brought, has just accelerated that, uh, that dimension. And, and you, see it, you see it every day. 
uh, we've got a part of our business, which some of you may know, which is called Anysmore, into which you've got brands like uh, you know, SB, Oxton, 25 Hours, 21C, all kind of brands throughout the world. And uh, this business has been doing amazingly, amazingly well because people are looking not for a bed and, uh, well, not everyone, but some people are not looking anymore just for a bed. They're also looking for uh, something which is kind of social hubbing, really, which is mixing up with the local people, getting some, you know, good food, getting some entertainment around it. Um, we just opened the Delano Hotel in Paris uh, last week, if you want to get there. See, it's, it's, an, it's an amazing place. And, and that is what you call experiential hotelry. And this is where people are less buying things and much more getting experiences. I think that's one thing uh, which is occurring. And candidly and more generally, um, um, you see pressure on prices in other parts of the world. So for example, if you are uh, uh, distributing goods like Carrefour of this world, you can really sense the fact that uh, some people are hit by the inflation and so kind of look differently at how and where they spend money. But I think in our world, um, there are some analysis that show that the share of wallet of what people are ready to spend is much more geared towards uh, experiences and much more geared towards spending time in hotels. So how, how deep is it and is it gonna stay post-COVID is the question that uh, everybody is asking themselves. But I think this share of wallet thing has shifted and will not come back to where it was before. People value other things post-COVID in, in the way they want to basically get a life. Okay, I think it's very interesting about the share of wallet having shifted away for, for the kinds of people who are coming to some of the kinds of properties that FCOR has. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think it's a good a, a cue for us to call a video which sort of captures FCOR's sort of sense, because you talked about experiences and emotions. These are things that part of your augmented hospitality uh, concept, which echoes a little bit what my colleague Varsha Aurora was talking about a moment ago in uh, aug um, uh, augment, uh, she was refers to it as hybrid hospitality. So as you see here, it, part of what Accor has been doing in the past seven years you, with augmented hospitality is you're moving away from just being a, um, putting heads in beds, just being a factory for hotel rooms, and it is about trying to meet customers where they live, work, and play. Uh, it is about, so you've made some purchases with, um, last year it took full control of Paris Society, which is a, a nightlife and event venue in um, leading one in France. You took for a co-working space, uh, Wojo is the second largest co-working uh, yeah. company in France and you, you have that. You just have Orient Express Ceiling Seas, which is your new, um, uh, you're taking to the water now. So you're taking hospitality uh, 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 into a very different context. So I think it's part of this move, you, you know, you've done Jean-Jacques Jean-Jacques, for, for like seven years, you've been with Accor. You've done about 12 billion euro of transactions, I believe. Yes, that's um, right. yes. And so there's been two, two actions with that. One has been filling out the brands. So you'll have a brands where everyone needs. You now have more hotel brands than anyone else in yes. any of the hotel company in the world. So you meet the customers with they need business, leisure, economy, and all the different geographies. Yes. So that's one of your goals. And the other has been augmented hospitality. So. With augmented hospitality, like at what point is this just a marketing talk, and at what point is it actually non-room revenue is going to be a significant driver for a core? So, do you have a goal like by say 2030, a quarter of a core's income is going to be not from traditional hotel rooms, or 50% is not from traditional hotel rooms? Or, yeah, you, you need to again put things in perspective. It is true that this is a, a, a new challenge. Uh, granted that this is only 100 hotels today, right? So this is... So uh, like 100 hotels. 100 today. hotels mm -hmm. is, is what, you, what, you, what you call lifestyle. Mm -hmm. These are way different animals. They make three, four times more fees mm -hmm. than any of our other hotels. And the reason for that is what you, you, you kind of explained, which is that uh, you've got a very significant and rich F&B dimension to it. So 50% of the turnover that I would do in the hotel is F&B. This is much less in the rest of the business, and it is, it is a rich F&B, i.e. an F&B that makes good margin. And so I think the contribution is very significant to the bottom line, but it will always remain uh, something of a different nature. Some people still want to travel and get a room which is standard, in a place which is standard, with a breakfast which is standard, to do their standard job. 
And then after that, when they go on weekend, they may want to get something less standard in their life, and they may go to one of those lower level pro properties. So I think, I think there is a trend here which is not gonna change, but just to be fair to everybody on here, it is, it, is, it is based on a springboard, which is the core business, right? Now, nevertheless, the trends that you see and the capability to expand um, the experience of the traveler is, is not gonna stop. I, th if, I think, you know, we've really tried at Accor over the last couple of years to not look at the guy as somebody who's gonna stay in a room, but accompany him throughout his journey. Hence the fact that uh, we, we went, and as part of the 12 billion of acquisition, for example, there was something around concierge. Uh, as part of the 12 billion of acquisition, there was a company called The Edge, which is very much versed into technology and hence able to provide some features that uh, you know, we could adapt into our own systems to make it. So make just it to pause there, so D Edge is your tech company, and so you, you offer, you use it as a client for your central reservation systems yeah. and a lot of tech, but you also offer it out as a service to other hoteliers. Yes. So just one. You're, you're absolutely right, yeah. I should have said that. It's, it's mostly managing our CIs. Mm -hmm. okay, I the central reservation system, system right. But, but it's a company that has uh, many, many skills, and notably an immense skill in our world, which is to be able to create API with all kinds of environments. So you can basically connect, in fact, your solution with uh, you know, properties in any place of the world, PMSs in any place of the world, and so there is an immense value, and the fact that they get uh, you know, 12,000 uh, uh, external hotels in their business portfolio on top of the 5,000 or the 6,000 that they get uh, with, with a call. Um, but, but we've tried to do that, and in fact, going on to the sea, and uh, you did not mention the trains with Orient Express, mm -hmm. is in fact another way to continue that journey of making sure that uh, you know, we, we kind of offer to people things that they may not have even dreamt of. And part of uh, you know, the battle that we went through over the last years uh, with the direct business, the importance of loyalty, was also to make sure that people were finding into the brands things that you know, were basically surprising them. And so we've been really working hard at that. Uh, hence the move that we did uh, on, on lifestyle way before anybody else in the industry. Today, everybody talks about lifestyle, right? A couple of years ago, people would say it's not even a segment. And a couple of years ago is probably three years ago. So it's not so long ago. And so I think by being always at the forefront of what you can offer in terms of experience, we're going to create a differentiating um, perception of what the company, of what the brands are. And, and, and this is what uh, customer value, and that's exactly why they go to see you, because they know they're gonna get something, something different. Just uh, the, the, the Orient Express, um, it's, it's, it's only two trains, right? So it's not a lot of trains, but it's a, a, a journey that you cannot even imagine. It's something which is just from another world. It's going into those old trains from the beginning of the century and crossing Europe. It's something which Again, if, if you're versed into those kind of experiences, it's unique. Uh, the, the, the boat is the largest sailing boat in the world. It's so this a boat is a boat that's going out in 2026, 20, yes. uh, and it's a new, sort of like a private yacht ex yes. style experience. Mm -hmm. So it's the largest sailing boat in the world. We are not going to own it. We're going to operate it, right? Because we are in the business of managing, in fact, um, uh, the fact that uh, people uh, uh, spend time on the boat, not, not really, uh, we're not a boat company, but, um, but um, it's, uh, it's a 200 meters, 220 meters boat, it's about uh, 50, uh, 50, uh, 50 feet, uh, and so it's, it's again something that uh, is unique, and the boat by itself is in fact uh, very much ESG compliant, because it's a sailing boat, it's rigid cells, three rigid cells, and when there is no wind, then you use hydrogen. So there is an element also of it, uh, which is the recognition by uh, Accor that ES ESG uh, uh, is, is um, an extremely critical component to incorporate into the way you develop the business uh, going forward. And, and that will be one of the champion of showing how much we care and, and what we do for that. So I know it's a, it's a lot of information but in, in the end, what matters out all of that is not so much the detail of all the information which is shared than the, the direction which is taken and the spirit in which the group is moving forward and has been moving over the last years. So the we don't want to be the standard U.S. corporation. 
I hope there is nobody. You, you don't want to be the standard U.S. No. Sorry. No, we are different. Mm -hmm. We are European. Uh, European. Mm -hmm. You're European, not like the U.S.-based companies. So, uh, how, how, so what are your three priorities over the next five years? It's, it's asset light, finish, finish the move to asset light. Yeah. And, uh, it is with your light, you, now you're going to become in May, you're leaving the chief financial officer role. You're staying as group uh, CEO, co-CEO. Deputy CEO, sorry, uh, and then you're you're becoming the CEO of the pr uh, the premium the yeah. premium mid scale and economy uh, brands. Yes. Um, so, what is the purpose of sort of that reorganization? Is is one of the potential advantages that um, by making that split where you have lifestyle and luxury in one place and premium mid scale and economy in the other, that a couple of years in the, down the line you would have the option to split the company? Is that one of the potential benefits or? God, you have a financial background? <laughs> That's what I get from every investor. <laughs> um, no, I mean, clearly no. I cannot say it more clearly. I think, I think um, is, it, is it an optionality that you create when you create two division that you make it something which is more uh, capable of being split, obviously. But this is not at all the intent. Let me, I, I talked to you about the fact that the company uh, has changed a lot, and, and you mentioned one dimension, which is uh, the asset light, and I mentioned uh, the other one, which is getting uh, more into uh, luxury. I think what we've got today is we've got a lot of brands. You said more brands than anybody else. We've got 43 brands in the company. And the realization that uh, we've made with, uh, with the board, with, uh, with Sébastien, is that uh, we now need to reap the benefit of it, right? And in order to reap the benefit of it, what we've been uh, thinking through is that we needed to be more focused. We are trying to ask everybody to do everything, which is never the right answer to resolving an equation. You want, you want people to be uh, more focused. More focus, more focus means, uh, means what? It's difficult for someone to deal at the same time with the development of an IBIS and the development of a raffle. This is not the same owner, this is not the same timeline, this is not the same amount, this is not the same requirement, this is not the same nothing. Nothing is similar. And so we, we, we've been kind of specializing the, time, the team over time and we want to move it to the next level. Moving it to the next level means that you create two divisions. Now, one division will be the premium mid scale and economy, will be kind of the old accord, if you will, the historical accord. It's Accor was born on Novotel, it was born on Ibis, it grew and then and acquired Sofitel, but it's fundamentally a mid scan and eco a DNA that you've got in the company, and it's a, it's a very rich DNA. I mean, 80% of what you will open in a year is mid scan and eco in, in Accor today. And so um, we want some people to focus on that, and they will be organized by region, just like it is today, and they will be very much focused on scale, i.e. the business model that you are into when you do uh, Miscal Eco Premium is a business model into which you always push the top line and compress the structure so that in fact you drive and increase profitability to the bottom line. That's what everybody does in the industry. Then we've got something which is the lifestyle and luxury and we've realized that managing them by geography doesn't work. What you want there is you want what, what the luxury brands would call maison. Right? It's the maison of LVMH, if you will. And by the so way... So like fashion houses yeah, have like a The a Gucci head of this world, the Chanel, the Dior. Uh, many, many of those brands are, are part of the, of the same group, except that nobody really knows that they're part of the same group, unless if you get interest at in understanding that. And so, uh, and by the way, LVMH has got 80, 80 brands, and just, just to put things in perspective, that don't communicate one, one, one with the other one. So it's a model that uh, absolutely works because it's being push through uh, for many, many years. And, and by doing that, you really put back the focus and the onus on the brand. And to sell a property at, you know, 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, whatever is the price, you really have to be able to get something which is unique, different, and that the people will understand as being the value proposition. And so in order to do that, you will have a fo focus teams by brands that will provide that tailor uh, experience. Um, and, and, and yeah, and that's something that I had heard last night when I was talking at the opening night reception from some people we're talking about. It's so important in luxury and lifestyle that you ha that there's a leader that the, the the brand is not too big. It's not geographically structured like you say. It's sort of like it's much more led by a, a, a thinking. I, I'd like to move on to like uh, sure. your your special purpose acquisition company. I think yes. by. Um, 
June 1st, you have to sort of announce a merger target yes. or else you'll have to give the money back to investors. Is there still hope that you will be able to uh, find a target and announce a target? Listen, it's, it's not really something uh, which is uh, decided in the sense that it is, uh, because if I were decided on that, I should make a statement. Okay. It's a public and traded company. Uh, but you see the direction that the SPAC have been taking. And so I think we will probably follow what uh, the general direction is being on SPAC. But I, I, I cannot state it um, uh, formally because it's a traded mm -hmm. and public company. And so, uh, so one of the new things that Accor uh, recently relaunched in the past month or so is your first global subscription card. Yeah. So for many, a couple decades, you had an Asia Pacific, a, sort of a business discount yeah. travel card. And uh, you have about 600 workers focused on that um, over there. So it's a significant business. But uh, what is your ambition with this global subscription card? I, I think the, the, the idea of the global subscription card, it's interesting. It's coming exactly from what you say, which is a, an Asia experiment done in Southeast Asia, which has been um, you know, steadily and resiliently making good money for 20 years plus. And so what we did last year uh, is uh, we tested China. Gary uh, is here and he's been leading that. Uh, and we tested uh, LATAM, Latin America, uh, Brazil. And it just ended up that uh, those two tests were uh, extremely fruitful. Uh, and when I say extremely fruitful, I mean, it, it's basically the fact that the people are consuming more versus what was happening when there was no, not those cards. We estimate that it's a 10% more that uh, they would basically uh, uh, consume by having the card, because the card only works if you do a minimum of X number of, uh, so, you know, so So, so, con so conceptually, if I'm in like uh, Nice, France, I would be a resident, I might pay something like 99 euro or $106 a year, and then when I'm traveling to, you know, your property in Dubai or somewhere, I get an elevated level of yes. uh, status in your, uh, yeah. and I get to it, have yeah, discounts it's, it's, first it's last time available. Discount. It's more than discount, more you're than absolutely discount. right. Yeah. It's, it's like a loyalty program, you, you don't only offer money, you offer also uh, status, you also offer capability to reserve at the last minute, it's also uh, the capability that you've got to choose um, some elements in, uh, in your booking, i.e. the room that you want, it's also uh, uh, the fact that um, uh, you, you've got, uh, you, can, you can book at the last minute and still get uh, the capability to, to, to get a, a space, if you will, and so it's financial elements, but wider than that, it's also uh, smoothness of your capability to travel. Mm -hmm. That sounds very interesting. And last minute availability is like a, a hotel that looks like it might be booked. If you're a member yeah. of the card, you'd yeah. be able to actually get yes. access to a room. Yes, yeah. yes. yes. Um, loyalty sort of ties into this. You just mentioned yes. it. So you have you revamped the loyalty program around January of uh, 2020, uh, and you sort of changed some of the tiers. Since then, you've added one fine stay, your luxury home vacation rentals property as a redemption option. Yep. Um, you've had about a year now or more of the post-pandemic surge to see how yep. it's been accepted. So how is, it, how is the loyalty program doing? Yeah, I think in the loyalty program, the, the most important uh, element is first that the people know the loyalty program. And, and we did spend um, quite some monies back in 2018, as you may recall, when we launched all. And there was an association with the Paris Saint-Germain. I'm sure uh, many of you may, may, may recall that. And so we made that name. Uh, being known. And then the, the other element that uh, we've been building over the last years is the ecosystem into which people can burn. Because in the end, it doesn't really matter that if you have a loyalty program, if you don't have the capability to burn the points. And so exchanges with uh, airline companies like uh, Air France, Qantas, capability also to burn those points by, uh, for example, booking taxi with uh, Carou, uh, all, all that monetization is uh, very critical, and uh, we have been launching also co-branded cards, um, one in France with the BNP, another one in Abu Dhabi, there is one also in, uh, in Malaysia. And so we, we are, um, in fact, as much as we can, um, creating some kind of a pool by which people get points, but those points have got a value, and the value is that they can exchange it against something that, uh, that uh, is valuable to them. So many people have got points in airline, but they don't have enough in order to book a ticket. When you have not enough to book an airline ticket, you may still have enough in order to get a, a room for one night somewhere else. This is kind of the principle of it. And so we've been building that ecosystem. It's, uh, it's quite comprehensive uh, nowadays. The other thing that uh, we've done is we spend uh, a, a large effort uh, starting 2021 on the CRM. 
customer relationship yep. and around and mm -hmm. with uh, Adobe but uh, but also Salesforce combination of the of the two uh, capabilities and uh, just as an example and the quantification the amount of business that we've been able to push through uh, in 2022 compared to the one in 2019 was up 18 percent so just for the push on the email because it's much more personalized because it's an omni-channel solution i.e you don't only uh, get uh, you know garbage mail uh, junk mail into the the mailbox of the people but it's something which is better tailored than attributes but also going through other means than purely the email you can go through wechat you can go through whatsapp depending on on who you are and so all of that creates the capability to communicate omni-channel and so more transversally to people on what they can do and then giving them the opportunity to burn those and the loyalty is super critical to uh, the direct business, super critical to the equilibrium that was found with the OTA, and, and super critical to the end customer, but also to the owner of the asset. So it's very powerful that you've unified the data that you have, you're, you have a partnership with Salesforce, the customer relationship management system, so you're much more savvy about yeah. the targeting, the remarketing. Um, we have some audience questions, and of course, throughout the day, you can put your questions into the app, uh, and we'll, we'll try to get to them in the last minutes of each session. So here's a uh, question. You are a chief financial officer, so this is a great one. So what metrics? So here, conceptually, the hotel industry is always using uh, revenue per uh, available room as like the standard. But you've talked a lot today, especially with lifestyle and luxury, that it's about revenue beyond the hotel room. What would be a better metric that sort of captures sort of like a earnings per square meter kind of concept that, as, that you think is better? So it's very interesting because um, one of the way by which we explain uh, what a lifestyle property does versus a standard properties is the fact that we are able to generate somewhere around 20% more revenue per square meter in a lifestyle property versus um, uh, uh, I would say a standard product. After that, you need to be going down to the bottom line because it's not only the revenue that makes your bottom line. You've got costs which are also of a different nature in a lifestyle property, but that's exactly uh, the way how we present it to asset owner. Uh, and, and, and just just one word on this one please, because it, it's, it's very important. You know, you, 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 may, you may wonder what makes a, a good uh, lifestyle property. There, there is definitely the guy who created it and the guy who is at the head of the concept and who is able to think, create, not everybody is a creator, but there is super importantly the people in the hotel. If you go to some of those properties, the recruitment is different, mm -hmm. the nature of the relationship is different, and hence the cost is different too, but that's what makes, in fact, the experience different. Sorry. No, no, that's great. Uh, and so do you, so revenue per square meter is something that you find is w yeah. in a lifestyle or luxury property, that would be what you would say. Yeah, we, we, we use that typically to explain the differences to the asset, uh, to the asset, uh, to the asset owner. Mm -hmm. So has COVID changed loyalty and the contribution of your loyalty members to your bottom line? I mean, the COVID years for loyalty were a, a, a disaster huh? because uh, like, like in, in my case, uh, I had my hotel filled, notably in Asia. Uh, with people that were, in fact, forced into the properties by the government, and hence in my numbers, but obviously not loyal customers. So if you just look at the ratio without extracting that, you've got a totally uh, um, disrupted and, and wrong picture of what is really happening. So now it's getting back to normal, notably since uh, I'd say things have really changed starting Q2 last year. And so things are getting back to uh, to normal on, on, the, on the loyalty. I, I think the, the, I'd say something that I've already said, which is in the way people look at the loyalty, they really look at where they can burn points. And they, if you don't have in your offering some properties, which are properties that are properties where people would like to burn their points, I think you, 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 you're probably missing a large part of, uh, of the value creation. I'll give you an example. Many, many of us would travel in a Pullman during the week because the Pullman is, is great for convention. You've got all the meeting rooms and stuff, but you probably don't want to take your family to the Pullman for a, a, a nice weekend uh, on the seaside. Not, not necessarily. You may want to go to a mass shelter. <laughs> so it's about having like a different offerings for, for, both, uh, yeah. for both needs and, and then the loyalty take program. Take into account how people think. Mm -hmm. Sorry, mm -hmm. I'm not probably enough specific. Mm -hmm. Post-COVID, what is changing is the fact that people now go to the hotel over the weekend. Ah, I see. Okay, mm -hmm. and so you need to offer them the capability to go to the weekend, to go to in hotel over the weekend. And why is that? Because as, as, 
as there is ESG constraint. People don't want to travel. As people have not been able to travel, they want it more. And hence, what we see is that people basically pigging back on business travel and doing so-called work uh, leisure or workation or call it the way you want, by which they do their normal trip, which normally would, they would try to get less trips but longer trip. And on top of that, when they do the longer trip, they try to associate you know, some personal things, either the family or for themselves to stay the weekend in New York or whatever. That's and great. So, yeah, so unfortunately, so we do have to, we yeah, do have to end it there. I'm sorry. Jean-Jacques, I've really enjoyed this conversation with you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you very much.